and they ran away screaming. Um, let's turn again to Acts chapter 13. Guys, I'm not sure I've ever written an easier message. There's just there's scripture upon scripture in here. Um, I love it when, when the word of God just shines out of anything that we say. It's always powerful. Every time, every time we're in prayer or worship or or study, and Scripture is on our lips, there's power there. And I believe we are reading some powerful stuff this morning as we get into this. Um, so we are. We're we're going to finish Acts 13. I know I got really excited last week about um, the call of John Mark, and so we remember now that Paul is. Because that's what we're calling Saul now, if we remember. Paul and Barnabas were led by the Holy Spirit on this missions trip through Gentile country, predominantly Gentile country, to preach the gospel. Uh, I want to make sure we understood a key thing here, that a missions trip, anytime that God sends us out from our native land into a, a place that we are unfamiliar with, and that could be that could be a place that is... 10 miles away could be a place that's, you know, a thousand miles away. It needs to be led by the Holy Spirit. It does not, it does not need to be a, well, this just seems like a thing we should do. It needs to be Holy Spirit driven, led, sustained. He's going to put it in hearts and minds. He's going to confirm it. He's going to open doors and bless it. And he's going to be in charge of that missions trip. So that is what is happening here. This was not their idea. They didn't go, hey, we should go on a tour of hostile territory. Um, This was like the Holy Spirit said, I'm going to send you out on the work that I would have you do. This is very, very important. Um, We believe in supporting missionaries. That's something that we do through Open Bible. Open Bible has a lot of missionaries out in this world, and we are excited to support them. Um, That is something you can do through the Open Bible website, and I highly encourage you, if God lays on your heart, to do that, to support those missionaries, those people that left their native land and went to go do something hard. Make no mistake, that is what Paul and Barnabas are doing right now. They are doing something hard, but they are doing something that they firmly feel, and not just them, Um, but they feel, and it was confirmed in the body, that they are to be sent out to this place. And so, Acts 13, verse 14. From Perga, they went on to Pisidian, Antioch. On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. This place is special. Like, we look at it right here, and we're like, okay, great, they're in a, a place that's, that sounds like it's a suburb of Antioch. It's not. Um, this is a, a place in the mountains. It's kind of remote. And it's what they would know as Galatia. This whole region is Galatia. And it is to this church that Paul will later write a letter that we know as Galatians. There is a mix of both Jews and Gentiles here. And we see Paul and his companions enter a synagogue, a habit that the disciples had in Jerusalem, where they would hear the Torah read, the words of the Old Testament, and then connect it to Jesus Christ. And that's something that our young people in Roots can do. We, huh, they, they stood up on the stage a while back. We let them take over the service. And they just did that from start to finish. They were just like, here's the Old Testament. And here's how it all points to Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is awesome, guys. It is not to be dismissed just because it's, there's, there's the New Testament. Doesn't mean the Old. Doesn't mean the Old passed away. It just connects flawlessly to the New. And if we understand that, it makes the Bible so amazing. So amazing, the love that God has for us and his people. So, so far on this missions trip, it's been so easy. They've gone to, uh, um, to the, the first stop was a place that already had a church and it was awesome. And then they went to this, 
the Sergia guy, this guy that was a proconsul, that was a leader of a, of a Roman region. And he's like, hey guys, come preach the gospel at my house. And the Jewish leaders here are, are just uh, setting them up now here in this place, in this mountain town to preach the gospel. Wow. It's just everybody seems so receptive to what God would do. And so Paul does. The gospel gets set up and Paul gets up to the plate. And that Old Testament I'm talking about, watch how much Paul brings it up here. Watch how he knows the history, how it all comes together, all for the glory of God and for the forgiveness of man. And you might say, that's all very well and good, Josh. Paul was a Bible scholar. He was a theologian's theologian. And he is equipped for speaking to these people about the word of God. In which case, the first thing I'd say is, ah, you've been paying attention. You know that Paul is a Bible scholar. Maybe you did. I hope so. Uh, And the second thing is this. And I would just have you turn to Matthew 5 really quick. Matthew 5 has been on my heart for a while now. I did a, a big, long message about it last year. Uh, we've been dropping it on Roots Youth Group for, we did like three or four weeks over it. Yeah. We, did, we, we did it on a while. And it's the words of Jesus. It is God in flesh really laying it out for us. Really speaking through a lot of... of uh, the fog, the confusion, the stuff that we added and created as men that just makes it hard to be with God. And so we really went over that in detail. And I just want to focus in on one verse here. Matthew 5, verse 6. Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. I love so much about that verse. A, it's that Jesus said it, that it's a promise. He's talking about what it takes to be in relationship with God. The whole first part of that in Matthew 5, starts about talking about that you are spiritually broke, that you are poor in spirit, that you have nothing to offer, and you mourn about that. You are sad about it, and all of that drives you to your creator. And then we submit to him, and we make him Lord, and the next step to a God that you are now to serve because he's forgiven this massive debt of sin that we've been carrying around The next step is to hunger and thirst to be in right standing with him. And how do you do that? How do you be in right standing with someone? I had a, I had a manager when I used to work at Pilot. I went through quite a few different general managers there. And it was always something when a new person came in, you always asked, I would always ask, so what's your thing? What's, what's the thing that is, I want to be on your good side. I want to do the job that I'm supposed to do, but I know we all have this little thing. Um, for him, it was very simple and it was very weird. We have these uh, hot dog rollers at Pilot. And there was always supposed to be food on there. That was easy. We kept food on there. Uh, but there was this thing that often got forgotten about the hot dogs. Underneath the roller trays was a little shelf that you pulled out, and that's where all the hot dog buns stayed. There were these pre-wrapped buns, and they stayed, and they'd stay under this griller, and they'd just stay warm. Well, how many of you know, <laughs> Wit's like, <laughs> um, How many of you know that when you can't see something, it doesn't always get the attention it might need, right? We can see. I could see at a glance uh, if there was coffee in a pot or if there was uh, hot dogs on the grill. I could see that. But you know what we couldn't always see is the hot dog buns. The amount of times that a driver would come up to us and would go, yeah, you got no hot dog buns for the hot dogs. And we're like, 
just use your hands. And they didn't, and we didn't say that, that was rude. I certainly never said that. Um, yeah. uh, and so we asked this general manager, what's the thing? Out of all the other things, you know, some people were like, the window's always clean, the floor is always clean. Uh, and this GM was like, I'll give you a world of grace if you just keep that hot dog bun tray filled. That's it. Just keep the hot dog buns in there and we'll work through everything else. Sure enough, he was good to his word. I might forget one thing or another, but he'd go in. He came in every day and he would check that hot dog tray bun and you could tell. If it was full, he'd be like, gonna be a good day. And if it wasn't, he would be like, <laughs> I mean, it was. It was instant like, Ugh. Guys, if you want to be in right standing with God, you're going to take the time to know God. You're going to take the time to get into his word, to obey his commands, to know what his commands are, to be able to walk uprightly with him. There's a lot of people that are, they're waiting for someone to tell them, this is how you be in right standing with God. And we have the tools now. We have the ability, we have, we have the word of God with us at all times in, in book form and phone. It's amazing, it's everywhere. And we can know him, we can learn and walk up rightly with him. Um, we don't have to just say, well, it's only for Bible scholars now. It's only for people that are in seminary or, or go to Bible college. You might not be able to quote it chapter and verse. But as you lay eyes on Scripture, I believe you are filled. I believe you are filled. Do we understand that? You are filled with the knowledge of God and you know him better as you read his word, and you can speak his heart and his will for his people to others that might not know or understand. It was so encouraging the other day when Kelly just starts going off about, it's like, I remember these things that just came up into my mind and people were asking questions and I was able to just say, well, it's this, and it, this is stuff that I remember hearing and I remember reading and I remember looking at it and you were just able to speak it over people and I'm like, that's it. That's, that's it. That's what Paul is doing here. Paul is filled with the Holy Spirit, not with head knowledge, okay? Head knowledge is, is good in so much as we lay eye on, eyes on scripture and we put it in our hearts and minds, but then we rely on the Holy Spirit to bring out those words for him to say to these people. And I believe he's doing the same in you, in your jobs, in your family, with your friends, with your neighbors, that you are filled and that as needed, those words of life come out of you. That it's, it's better than your opinion, that it's better than your advice, that it is scripture that it is scripture that you are speaking over someone. And I love those moments when they're like, oh, that sounds really smart. Where'd you hear that? The Bible. Yeah, the Bible. I speak that over you here in New Beginnings, that as you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be filled and you won't have to worry about what words you have to say. Another thing Jesus tells in disciples, don't worry. Don't worry about what you have to say. The oh, Holy Spirit will help you out. He'll tell you what to say. He'll lay it on your hearts and minds because you're filled. You're filled with them already by putting your eyes on Scripture, by hearing it spoken over you. For those that have ears to hear, let them hear and trust it that when God needs to use it, it will be there. So verse 16 Tell me if uh, any of this sounds familiar, Roots, as Paul starts to just lay out the Old Testament. We've done this Wednesday after Wednesday for so many weeks. We would just go, like, real quick, like 90 seconds to the Old Testament, just every time. 
Verse 16, standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. We're back in Acts 13. Acts 13, verse 16, thank you. Listen to me, the God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt with mighty power. He led them out of that country. For about 40 years, he endured the conduct in the wilderness, and he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached the repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, Who do you suppose I am? I am not the one you are looking for, but there is one coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Yeah, Paul references the shoe, guys. The shoe. The shoe. Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. And at this, in this mountain town, in this remote synagogue, guys, the Gentiles just heard that last verse. For so long, as you'll recall, as we've been talking about, the Gentiles have been the, you're not worthy, you're not good enough, you have to stay on the fringe, you have to be outside the line. And Paul just said something that says, it is to us. It is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. And he included them in the invite. And I can just imagine the Gentiles leaning forward here. Salvation rescued from the eternal debt of sin that we carry, never satisfied by the blood of lambs and bulls, but offered through the promise of Jesus Christ. And imagine that room going real quiet, real still. Some have heard the name of Jesus in this place. Word has traveled, but I'm sure many have not. Many are hearing this for the first time. This this Jesus person sounds very important. Tell us everything about him. And the next part would cut them to the quick. Verse 27, the people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus. Yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. The words that they just read here in the synagogue, the words that they read every Saturday, they speak to Jesus fulfilling the covenant of Abraham, of repairing the relationship between God and man that goes all the way back to a garden. Verse 28, they found no proper ground for a death sentence. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. Paul lets them know they killed him. They killed the promise. But it was all a part of God's plan for you. Because he loved you so much that while we were still sinners, he sent his one and only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 29 When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. And we'll stop right there because as much as I liked it, I I often use the New International Version uh, when I'm preaching. Translation matters. It misses something here. And this is a big one. In the Greek, the word for cross is stavros. 
And that's not what it says here. In the original Koine Greek that Luke writes here, he says, Zylu, which means tree. Go to Deuteronomy 21. Let's look at some of this Old Testament that we're, uh, that Paul has been quoting here a whole bunch. Um, when the disciples are preaching to the Sanhedrin, it's the same word. They say Jesus was hanged on a tree in Acts 5.30. They use the same word there, tree. This is very significant because of Deuteronomy 21, 22. When someone is convicted of a crime punishable by death and is executed and you hang him on a tree, his corpse must not remain all night upon the tree. You must bury him that same day for anyone hung on a tree is under God's curse. You must not defile the land that the Lord your God is giving you for possession. And if you're reading the NIV, in that verse, it probably says pull. The word is tree. Uh, mine is the New Revised Standard Version. And if you look at an inner, yeah, if you look at the uh, interlinear from, whether it's Hebrew to English, or if you look at Greek to English, um, the words here are, are clearly true. And this holds special significance. Because Jesus hung on a tree. Go to Galatians 3 real quick. Jesus hung on a tree, meaning, according to Deuteronomy 21, Jesus was under God's curse. Which Paul is going to tell the people right here of Galatia this very thing. He's going to break it down for him. The very church that is being formed here this day in Acts 13, as a bunch of Jews and Gentiles listen, Paul is going to write to them in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed, is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. He became the curse for us. It's scripture calling the scripture. Deuteronomy 21 to Acts 5 to Acts 13 to Galatians 3. Paul lays it out for him. He says, Gentiles, you are not under the curse anymore. Because someone became that curse. There's a lot of us that still walk around like we're cursed, like we're under the curse. But Jesus became the curse. So we don't have to be under it anymore. But we can, in our flesh, we can still walk around like we're under it. Can't we? You know what I'm talking about? Maybe not today, but boy, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. The second something doesn't go our way, the second we get our feelings hurt, the second, the second we you know, look at our bank account and we go, I'm clearly under the curse. <laughs> we have those moments, but... But Christ became that curse for us so that we weren't under it anymore. You, whatever your circumstance, whatever you feel, the curse need not apply. Acts 13 again. And here, here we see what this has all been about. Because through faith, we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit that you might be filled, that you may know that the same Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you. Paul is about to give them good news because he just told them the promise that was meant for you, that was to be the curse, to meant to take that curse from you, off your shoulders. We killed him. Acts 13, verse 30. But God raised him from the dead. 
Guys, that fact will never not be amazing. He is risen. That is not just a thing we should proclaim on Easter Sunday. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, the spotless lamb, and he was killed because he had known no sin. He was able to take the keys to sin and death, paying the debt for us. And now he is risen, and that affects all of us. And Paul knows there's going to be some doubters here. Some people who go, wait, where's your proof? It's a nice story, but they really went high on testimony back then. They wanted somebody else who was like, somebody else vouch for what we have to say. You, you can say that, but, but who else? Does anybody else know, believe what this guy is talking about? Anybody have something to say about it? Verse 31, for many days he was seen by those. Jesus was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. Jesus appeared to his disciples repeatedly. He appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. And lest you think he's done appearing, he's done working, I ask you, why do we do God sightings every Sunday morning? If you've never been to our church on Sunday, we just take a moment to say, what is God doing in our lives? How is he moving? How is he working? How is he revealing his heart, his purpose, his goodness, his miracles in our life? He is active. He is moving now. And we have a testimony. We are those people now who can say, I know he's real because I've encountered him through the word, through worship, or just the various times that he's just shown up in a way that I was blown away by. He is alive and he is moving in our midst and we are his witnesses of a risen Savior to this day. Verse 32. We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. It is, as it is written in the second psalm, you are my son. Today I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. As God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is also stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. Wow. A justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Take care what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish. For I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. This is how God starts a church, you guys. He sends people that are hungry and thirsty. And he fills them with the Holy Spirit and power to proclaim the gospel. And the people that hear, that actually hear, say, we would like to know more. Please tell us more. Please come back. Tell us more about that. Verse 43. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism, and that's a fancy way of saying Gentiles, followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. It is our calling to do that with new Christians, sometimes with old Christians, to those that would be taking those spiritual baby steps 
to championing championing them, to encourage them, to keep one step towards Jesus. Yeah, sin is there. Your flesh is still very much there, but so is his grace. The grace that would urge you on step by step, reminding you to turn, to always turn towards the one who died for you so that you didn't have to stay stuck in that sin. What kind of person do you want to be in this walk with other Christians? Think about it like a baby that is just learning to take their first steps. Would you get up in that baby's face and be like, do better? Or would you be, I've seen this so many times when my kids were learning to walk. What do we do? What do we do when you see those first steps? Good job. Yeah. You're doing it. Yes. And we just get real excited. We get real excited about such small steps, don't we? Real excited. We don't go over and push that kid down. (laughs) Maybe my son did to his siblings, the way he's acting. Maybe that's something he did. But I would encourage you guys, we want to be those Christians that as people are coming to know the Lord, we champion them. Don't actually do it in that voice. That would be weird. You're doing it. No, don't do that. Um, But just be there to disciple, to love on, encourage, and strengthen. I love that verse right there that it says, um, Many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. Urge them that grace is there. Reminded them that it's like, okay, yes, keep living this life for God. No more about God. Now we're on the path to hunger and thirsting for righteousness. Let's do this life together. This message has a profound effect in this mountain town. Verse 44, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. And why? Because the world wants to hear about grace. The world turns up for grace. To be strengthened, guys, and encouraged by that. This next part stings. But hold to the fact that a church got planted that week and people came to know their Savior. Verse 45, when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, we had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Those are the words of Jesus right there, spoken to Paul on the road to Damascus. And now they are scripture. I love that Paul didn't retract any of what he had said here. He didn't cower or try to be popular, but instead he reinstates that, yeah, the door of salvation has been kicked wide open to the Gentiles and to the whole earth. Beware of pride, you guys. Beware the need to please the crowd, um, to say what people would like you to say. Paul rejected all that, forsaking all for the cause of Christ, but also... There were Gentiles there that were listening. Would Paul recant? Would Paul take it back? Or would he stand upon the word that he had spoken? And that's what he did. He stands upon the gospel and he speaks truth. To quote Paul in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, 
than to the Gentile. Acts 13, 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. When you stand firm in the faith, you guys, you, you get to be a part of these moments. It says the Gentiles were glad. We use words like that. Have you ever seen someone that, that's truly glad? Because here, here, you read that and you can be like, oh, they're all smiles. They're like, oh, we're happy. Guys, I bet they were a mess. <laughs> I bet they were an emotional, spiritual mess. They were just floored. They were just connecting to God like they never had before. I believe they were filled. All because Paul and Barnabas and others came to them to become the salt, to become the lampstand, the city on a hill that cannot be hidden, to draw all men and women to Christ. I pray that you stand firm this week. I know it's hard. Um, you think it wasn't hard for Paul? It was very hard. He just stood up to local Jewish leaders, same as Jesus did his entire ministry. You're going to have to stand up for the faith. You're going to have to stand upon the word. But remember that in your journey on this earth, it does not come down to how much money you made, how many people liked you. It comes down to were you able to be a part of verses like verse 49. Can someone point to you and say, I know Jesus because you showed up and told me. Or when I was doubting, you encouraged me to walk in his grace. Verse 49, the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. Let's take a second. I would ask just that you pray with me right now, New Beginnings. God, we pray for this region. We pray for this area that we live in, the small towns, the rural places, Brooklyn, Malcolm, Guernsey, Victor, Grinnell, Hartwick, Montezuma, countless others, God, that your word would spread. That we could be the salt. That we would let your light shine. The light that is in us, God, let it go out. Let us be your vessels. Let us stand on your word. Let us speak it when it is hard. Let us know it. Let us put eyes on it. And let it come out every time it is supposed to. Let it be your words of truth. Let it be your words of hope and life. And as it lands in fertile soil, God, we pray for those moments where people are glad. Where it gives them the hope that they never thought they would have. Where it gives them peace, regardless of their circumstance. Where it gives them joy. Where they have only known sorrow for so long, God, I believe that you have something good and new for them through the power of the blood of Jesus, through the good news that you did not stay dead, but you are risen. And you give hope for all of us. And we can all be heirs to the promise. May we be a part of that as a church. Amen. And I'm going to keep preaching. Matthew 5. We looked at Matthew 5, verse 9 really quick. We talked about hunger. Or Matthew 5, verse 6. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. As we look at what Paul is about to endure, when we look at this little tiny bit that we think, it's like, oh, that stings, that's mean. It's going to get way worse in this next chapter. And I would like to remind you of Matthew 5, verse 11. Jesus says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. 
rejoice and be glad. That word glad again. Because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now back to Acts 13. These are the things we can expect. If we want to live for Jesus, if we want to walk with Jesus, expect to be treated like Jesus was. And Jesus was rejected by the world. So don't be surprised when the same happens to us. Acts 13, verse 50. But the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium. That's something that Jesus said to do too. If you went into a town and they would not hear the, the word of God, if they were not interested in the gospel, shake the dust off your feet and go. And it would be worse for those towns than Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 52. Keep in mind, they just got rejected from a region. Not from a town. Town wasn't good enough. They were like, get out of the town. Get out of the state while you're at it. You're not welcome here. He had to be more like Powershee County. Get, get out. You're, you're not welcome here. And you would fully expect verse 52 to be like, and the disciples left being like, man, that started off as such a good missions trip. And then it just got hard. And people were mean. And people, people threw us out. And so now we go and lick our wounds, and now we go, God, did we do the right thing? Were we acting, we were saying the, so many questions. What does verse 52 say? And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. That gladness that Jesus promises in Matthew 5, 11, it's there. It's there. They understand they're blessed. They understand that though persecution may come, that they might get run out of a place, that there is joy and gladness in there because it's not about them. It's not about, it's not about their hurt feelings. It's not about them being ejected from a place. It's about the word of God spread. It's about them being filled with the Holy Spirit regardless. Things don't go your way sometimes. Things are hard, people turn against you. What is your reaction? I know what my reaction can so often be. It can be to call my wife, who I love dearly, and to say, everyone is dumb and I don't like them anymore. And it's hard and I don't, I don't like things. And then my wife will just... She'll speak scripture over me. And she'll say those things that just infuriate my flesh. Like, are you standing on the word of God? Do you have the joy of the Lord right now? Are you trusting God? Are you having faith in God? I'm just like, my flesh is, stop it! And my spirit is just, yeah, 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 yeah. This is why we're meant to do life together, guys. This is why um, we do things like women's group, like guys group. We are meant to encourage one another in the faith. And I believe that there are, there are times when we absolutely have to lean on one another and say, man, my flesh just doesn't want to. And then we have to stand up as men and women and say, yeah, but the word of God says. The word of God says. And so I turn this question to myself and I say, things are hard, people turn against you, and what's my reaction? Guys, our reaction is called to be through the promise, through the blessing, joy. If it's not joy, I question. I question myself. When it's not joy, what am I filled with in that moment? 
Am I filled with what I want to do? How I think things should go? With my desire to want to control other people and have things go exactly my way? My flesh, I know, says eye for an eye. It says someone hurts me, I hurt them back. It says complain that I am in the wilderness. It says grumble to God when things don't go my way. That's me on empty. That's me filled with nothing but what I want to do and myself and the things and the cares of this world. That's me hungering and thirsting to appease my own flesh, my own needs and wants. But as I turn to scripture, as I turn on worship, as I pray, as I cry out to God, as I say, Jesus, your Lord, I'm encouraged to come before him to step into his presence, broken, empty, and to trust him as I say, I can't do it, God. I, I'm not meant to do it on my own. I'm not meant to do it in my own strength. I need you. I call you to be encouraged in the grace that he offers you today. Do you see how much he's already done for you in your life? All that Paul spoke of, laying out a fraction of the history in the Old Testament, of all that you could have, also that you could have this opportunity now to hunger and thirst for righteousness and to be filled, to be filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. You do not have to walk around like you're under the curse anymore. You can choose to be filled with joy and peace and love. And that's all about if you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness. So I'm going to give you an opportunity here in a, in a second. Uh, if that's something that you're wrestling with. But right now, I would tell you this. And I pray you receive it. I pray you receive it every time I say it. Uh, I never want it to be this thing that, that you're just like, that means church is over. I want you to hear it. I want you to receive it. May the Lord bless you. May you understand that's his heart for you to walk in his blessing. He didn't have to do that. He could have just said, I'm God, I'm the creator, I made everything, serve me, this is how it is. He said, no, I want good for you. I want you to understand how much blessing there is. May he bless you and may he keep you. May he walk in his safety and his protection May God just surround and encompass your life, that you rest in him, that you know no matter what befalls you, that he has you. May his face shine on you, and may he be gracious towards you today, covering a multitude of sins. God, help us to turn, turn, turn from them today towards you as your face turns towards us and you see us. And Lord, may we just have that perfect peace that you promise. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to stop there.